Good afternoon and welcome back inside this old house in Hopalong Hollow. This is Jerry. It's November and the garden is pretty much spent. As a matter of fact, as I look out this window, I can see that the only thing left in my garden are the buried roots and possibly thousands upon thousands of seeds. But there's no reason that you cannot bring your cottage garden into your house over the winter. Using various methods, how do you bring your English or American cottage garden into your home? Well, one of the most surefire ways to do that would be through the use of wallpaper. Wallpaper's been around for hundreds of years and it's no wonder. It's just such a great way to transform a room almost immediately. It's not difficult to hang wallpaper. You can get very expensive wallpaper or you can get inexpensive wallpaper. No matter what kind you get, you're bound to find something that you really love. Florals, botanicals, inspired by nature prints are so easy to find. I learned how to wallpaper from my mother because she loved to do wallpaper in her rooms and she had an early American style. I prefer more of the florals and this print in particular, I've actually used it in a bathroom as well, but with different colors. So it's the same print, but it has different shades on the roses and on the background. So here's one way for sure to bring color into your home, is the beautiful use of wallpaper. And then the wallpaper in and of itself becomes your wall decor. There's not a whole lot you have to do after that, rather than hanging just a few pictures. You don't really have to densely pack your pictures on a wall that's already completely a piece of art. It's about using wallpaper. Just try it in a small room, like a very small bathroom, and get a tiny floral print. And maybe just put it on one wall, such as a back wall, with a corresponding or coordinating paint. And when you find out how easy it is and how much it will transform a room, you will be so encouraged to try wallpaper in as many rooms as you like. Now you can see in this room that I'm not afraid to use color because I love it and I even use it on the ceiling in many rooms. Now I know for a fact that these colors are not coming across as true in this video because as I look at my camera here they're looking really bright but they're not. They're very subdued, subdued greens and uh, two different shades of green. This is called sea foam on the ceiling and up on the top of the wall. And I believe this is sort of a, what was that, a hunter green. Yeah, a hunter green around the door frames. So don't be afraid to use color. I mean, just jump in there, find your favorite color, and use it, even if you just use it on a very small room. Just give it a try and see how much it does for a room to bring the outside into your home. One of the nicest things about wallpaper is that it does become your wall decor. And it's not necessary, therefore, to densely pack pictures on the wall like we did in the other room downstairs, because the wallpaper is your art. However, that doesn't have to keep you from hanging pictures, of course. And in this case, I'm only hanging the picture frames, because these fascinating picture frames are works of art just in and of themselves. I love the little tassels on that, the little dings and, and dents in this frame. It's actually a very, very lovely piece of art. And the one next to it here, I believe this is called Gutta Percha, and it was a sort of a plaster work, molded plaster work that was done in the 1800s to create these lovely designs. It was done on picture frames. It was also done on fireplaces and uh, wall moldings and all sorts of intricate details in an 18th and 19th century home. This one is also Gouda Percha, but also it has a marvelous image inside. Do you want to tell you a little bit about? This picture frame is a stunning photograph very old photograph of a ballerina. And this was given to me for Christmas by a friend who 
gave me a portfolio full of old, old photographs. And this one fit perfectly in this frame. Her pink and green matches the wallpaper and the sea foam walls. and the filigree that I placed all the little berries all around the frame can get pretty dusty and they're not easy to clean but it sort of puts me in mind of Miss Habersham and Great Expectations, her dining room full of cobwebs <laughs> dusty antiquity a little dust never hurt anybody and it just really doesn't bother me So here we have a grouping and another addition to creating a garden in your home. Match a lot of quilts and coverlets and afghans with coordinating colors on your chairs and your bedding. Just layer upon layer of pattern and color, just like we did in the room downstairs, except this time we're giving it a more bright and cheerful look. Together with floral and chintzes, curtains, and needlework, botanical pictures on the wall, trees and curtains full of flowers, and plant life are just the thing to bring the garden inside the house. I think this is such a beautiful print because it's got bluebells, roses, and my very favorite little foxgloves here. And then behind that, you can see that it's picking up the same colors as the wallpaper. And the framing color on the window frame is of course the biggest garden color of all and that would be green put a little green in your room and you are definitely bringing the garden into the house last video about english decor we used a lot of really dark woods but in this room we are using a lot of old pine furniture and pine is very english and it's also very american uh, wood that was easy to come by. It has a beautiful finish on it. It has a beautiful patina. These are old pieces and they are meant to look old. I do not like perfect furniture and that's good because I don't have any perfect furniture in this house. But I seriously love pine. It just has that beautiful golden look. It brightens up a room. Looks beautiful with a floral wallpaper. And even though this piece right here is actually a piece that should be in a kitchen because it was a pantry, this makes a great wardrobe for clothing and, you know, closets are pretty scarce in these old houses. This makes a beautiful cupboard. You don't have to use furniture for the purpose that it was created. You can use it in all sorts of different rooms. This is a Welsh dresser, which I think is my favorite, favorite piece in this entire room. But just look at how that shines and how gorgeous it is against that wallpaper simply by adding little touches here and there in the room. You are bringing the garden inside. And the displays on your tables, and your dressers, and your shelves, are also a wonderful way to get that outdoor feeling and that spring-like flavor inside your room. And of course you can actually physically bring the garden in your house when you bring in those dried flowers that we did over the last season lovely English look using items that you would want close at hand such as your cosmetics or your books, your notebooks, something for beauty, flowers, and just a little item of interest which in this case is a little calling card book and calling cards were basically business cards of the past. You would go knocking at someone's door and they weren't home. You would leave your calling card, which was specifically designed for you, or they could be purchased in bulk packs. You would write your name on the back, 
You can see the difference, um, how beautiful they are. They're so beautiful that they actually designed this little book to collect calling cards. <laughs> so pretty. That one thing that intimidates people about changing their style of decor is that they feel intimidated about arranging things in a room. And so we're going to take this dresser right here, this beautiful old Welsh pine dresser, and it's got a pretty tall, uh, pretty nice surface on top. That's pretty wide. And we're going to take some items, which we're going to choose, and we're going to arrange them in different ways, because I just want to show you how much fun it is, how absolutely easy it is once you get the hang of it. And I think you'll be happy to see that it's something that you can learn how to do. Also, uh, right behind this, let's just look at what's on the wall. We've got two samplers, one of which does not completely fit in the frame. And so about two inches of wallpaper is exposed behind that. And I'd kind of like to camouflage that. I don't really like the way it looks. So we're going to see if we can do something to camouflage that at the same time without hiding the sampler. Now here I have a collection of items, all of which I want to put on the top of that dresser. So let's see what we've got here. Number one, we've got a collection of books. And what they actually have something in common. Every single one of these books is about Beatrix Potter. Who could know there would be so many books, not by Beatrix Potter, but about Beatrix Potter. And then I also have some old-fashioned rabbits. So this is uh, chalkware rabbits, little candy container rabbits. This is what they used back in the old times. Look at that. The head comes off and you put candy inside. That's the same way with this one, except he's missing an ear. So we've got the rabbits. And here we've got some eggs. This is a cloisin egg which I really like. And this was one of the first antiques I ever bought. This is an old, old, old Easter egg, which opens up. Hard to do this with one hand. Okay, I won't do it, but trust me, it opens up. And then we also have something here. We have some pin cushions. These are just old pin cushions. We've got a lovely little ribbon bit of roses and two round boxes. Now the round boxes are going to be our garden bones, or I should say our decorating bones, because they are going to be the surface on which we are going to build a lot of height. Then we've got these three little cats, and I'm thinking, I don't think I'm going to put these little cats on this particular dresser, so those are going to be put aside. And let's just take these items and see how we can do something on that dresser. The first thing you want to think about when displaying is the largest pieces are going to be your garden bones or basically the bones of your display because they're actually the most important pieces. They may not be the prettiest, but they are the most important pieces when it comes to designing um, a tabletop or in this case a dresser. So I'm using this wonderful old cheese box. I want this lapping to show because I think that's what makes it so interesting. It gives it, uh, it's, a, it's an old piece of history this old cheese box, they don't make these anymore. And instead of putting it under the smaller picture, I want to put it here because remember, I want to camouflage this opening space right here under the sampler. Now, if I put it over here, I won't be able to use this surface for any display without blocking the piece behind it. I don't want to raise the pictures because I want them at eye level. So I'm going to slide it over here as far as I can because I need a lot more surface here to display all those other little items. So the next item that we have that's a large item and pretty important for this dresser would be the books because they take up a lot of space, they're heavy as well, and they're very important. Now first I could do this in the stair step manner where the books are just going down in a nice lean-to shape, but I want the height to cover that little corner of the sampler. And there are two books here that I actually want to use as artwork because they really are. I really love the cover of this Beatrix Potter book. It stands all by itself. It's very beautiful and it just constitutes really a painting on the table. 
And the other one that I like, because I actually refer to this a lot for inspiration, is this wonderful, wonderful Beatrix Potter book with lots of little inserts and letters and photographs. If you're a Beatrix Potter aficionado, you would really love to have this book. Little letters. I mean, this is just a beautiful, beautiful book. And I want it to be easy to get to, and I want it to be part of the decor. So I'm going to take these two beautiful books, and I'm going to put them on the end here. It doesn't block the picture. And it gives me some more height. It's gotten dark on us. I had to do a few things, and now it's night, so it's a little bit different um, atmosphere in this room right now. But now that we've got the garden bones down, which would be the the big box and the books, we get to put in the flowers, which would be the interesting little things, such as these bunnies. So the bunnies come next. And the first bunny, which is a chalkware, rather a heavy little piece, and it's chipped on one side, and I don't want that chip to show, so I'm going to use this as a bookend right here on the books. It's pretty heavy. It will hold those books up, although they don't really need much help. And then I'm going to take this little 1940s, 1930s rabbit, made of pressed cardboard, I believe, and I'm going to lean him right over here. And I'm going to arrange these other rabbits in sort of a little rabbit gathering up here on the table, along with the ribbon roses, which are a beautiful complement to the samplers behind and the wallpaper because of the colors. So I'm going to place that right back here in the corner. And so we pretty much camouflage that space, that couple inches of showing uh, wallpaper that's exposed behind the sampler frame. And then putting the tall rabbits in the back so it's not to hide the picture. We're going to put them in a nice little arrangement as if they're all having a nice conversation. I think that looks pretty nice. And we still got one rabbit left. And I have thought about putting him either here, which I don't know about that, or putting him over here by the books. What do you think? Now this arrangement would be perfectly fine just leaving it as it is because you've still got a lot of table space left. But I do still have a pincushion collection that I need to find a place for, so I still want to put that on this table. So without making it too much of a cluttered mess, I'm going to go ahead and do that. So here we have the pin cushions. These are the old pin cushions, and lo and behold, one of them happens to be shaped like a carrot with little crochet flowers on top. So I'm going to take that little carrot and I'm going to place it right here. And then I have two little paper mache carrots, which we will just place right next to them. And isn't that pretty appropriate for Beatrix Potter books to have carrots and bunnies surrounding the books? And now the pincushions. They're just old Victorian pincushions. This one's really a lot more ornate than I would ever want, but what I really like is the plaid side. But the beadwork is what's impressive, so we'll put that in the front. And then this old upholstered Pin cushion and this very, very strange little thing. Now, <laughs> I consider myself a keeper of the past. I, I'm not, it's not because I'm not a materialistic person, but I love history. And I think that somebody should be looking at these items and, and thinking about where they came from, how they were used, because it was a completely different world than we, what we live in today. I mean, when pin cushions were such a necessity, and they were made with such creation and such invention as such a little thing like that could become a piece of a little bit of beauty. And somebody made this. Somebody filled this with sawdust and made every little piece by hand. And then they used it to the degree that it, it, it's quite marked up and a little bit raggedy. But if you love history, there's a good reason for collecting antiques because you really are keeping the past alive through these little things that you have. And hopefully you can pass these on to someone else who will appreciate them as much as you do.
of all the arrangements I made, I think I like this one the best. And you may think, oh, well, that is so staged. Well, yeah, it absolutely is staged. And that's the whole point. The point is to take a little place in your home, a tabletop, a dresser, a shelf, and turn it into a little art gallery. Something that you created yourself, something that speaks to you in some sort of a way, and use that space to create something charming or beautiful or, or meaningful to you. So you have to do something with the top of this dresser. So why not make it something that you really love? Another way you can bring the garden into your home is to bring some of the garden furniture into your home over the winter. This is a folding little metal table. We have several of these that we bring into the house in the winter to keep them from rusting and losing their color. And this is going to be used as a reading stand next to a big cushy chair with lots of quilts, tiny little garden prints, floral background once again against that wallpaper. And here are those wonderful dry flowers that we did several months ago. And they have just retained their color so wonderfully. The roses, the poppies, the zinnias, the chives, lamb's ear, goldenrod, and beauty berries. This was one of the purposes of drying those flowers, that we could put them in baskets around the house, and we still have so many left to use for wreaths. But the beautiful faded glory of these roses give them a look of antiquity and, and such a beautiful look in your garden, in your home. Well, if you're from my era, you probably loved Nancy Drew just like I did. Good old Nancy Drew. I must have read every single one of those books half a dozen times. And there you have it, another very simple table arrangement. If you look around, you'll see that from the tiniest prints to the boldest of prints, the garden is everywhere in this room. So those are just a few ideas on how to bring the garden into your home. Create little garden vignettes using wallpaper and fabrics and displays. And now I'd say it's time to go try a new tea. So let's go make a proper pot of tea. Today we're going to make a proper cup of English tea following the English rules of tea making. And we're going to start out with an absolutely beautiful English teapot. This is my very favorite English teapot. Can you believe the, this gorgeous pot? It's covered in little acorns and oak leaves. It is so beautiful. I've had it for about 10 years and I don't know if you can buy these anymore. Um, but this one is from English Collectibles. It's so gorgeous and it's a very large teapot. And it's also got matching cup and saucer, of course. And today's tea, we're going to have a loose leaf tea and this is Twining's Earl Grey tea since 1706. An aromatic black tea blend scented with a citrus bergamot flavor. Now, according to the rules, you must start with fresh water and you should not ever reheat your water. You should start with a fresh pot of water. And the reason you don't reheat your water has something to do with the oxidization in the water, changing the flavor of the tea. I don't know, I'm just following the rules.
First things first, we want to take our hot, fresh water and heat up the teapot. So I'm going to pour about half of my water in my teapot to get it nice and warm. Well, your teapot heats up. Get your little tea infuser. This is uh, one of my little tea balls. Seen better days. And make your tea as strong or as weak as you wish. I like pretty strong tea, so this probably has about three teaspoons of loose tea in it. Now, after your water is heated sufficiently, you want to throw that water away. Okay, our teapot is nicely heated up. So we will take our little infuser ball, set it in the pot, and we will pour the water right over the tea ball. Looks like my tea ball is leaking little bits of tea. That's okay. I don't mind a little loose tea in my cup. And you're going to let that steep for three to five minutes. Well, it's been about five minutes. Our tea is beautifully colored. And it's um, time to pour. I have to admit, I really like this ritual once in a while. It's rather an elegant and luxurious way to drink tea. Um, and especially when you drink and pour from the beautiful cups and teapots. So that's a beautiful color right there. That's a lovely colored tea. And of course, whatever sweetener you want to use. Now I am told that tea is not exactly proper unless you serve it with tea biscuits. And here we have what are considered English tea biscuits and digestive crackers. <laughs> now, uh, in America, we call these cookies, but these are not very, very sweet. And this particular brand, Scottish Biscuits, they have very, very little sugar in them, but basically made of oats. And if you love oats, which I do, these are really, really tasty. The only sweet ones are the digestive crackers, and these are very good. So we're going to add a couple of those with our tea to make it a proper English tea. Now, have a little set. Mm. That's a lovely cup of tea. Now, I've had this tea before, and um, so I know already what my verdict on the tea is. As far as an Earl Grey tea, I think it lacks that really strong bergamot flavor, which I like. So it's not my favorite Earl Grey. Um, it's a nice flavored black tea, but as far as getting any extra flavors in there, I just really don't taste them. So this is Twinings or Twinnings. I'm not quite sure how that's pronounced. And of course, it's a good black tea. But if you want a really strong tea that's got a lot of bergamot and citrus, we'll try another tea at some other date. In the meantime, from Hopalong Hollow, this is Cherry. And enjoy your cuppa and your biscuits. And we'll see you next time in Hopalong Hollow. Bye.